Um, so I want to go back because there's so many things I want to ask you about. What talk a little bit about your, you know, your your in the very beginning, how you decided you wanted to become a singer. Well, I was raised with a singer, and my father was a great singer. And so as a little girl, I was always trying to learn the songs that he was singing, all the Rogers and Hart, Rogers and Hammerstein, plus the Christmas songs, plus Danny Boy. He had a big, big repertoire, and I always wanted to sing everything. And I, the first time he had me come on stage with him was in 19, when I was three, and it was in Butte, Montana, and uh, he was touring for National School Assemblies, and uh, which was established by Roosevelt as part of the, the attempt to get music back into the, into the world. And um, so he said to me, do you want to sing something on the show in the intermission? And I said, sure, I'd love to. I loved an audience. I was, I was a ham right from the start. And so I sang. Um, I'll be home for Christmas. And of course it was a big hit. It was also April, but from that time on, I was performing either in public or for my teachers or my school shows and on my father's radio show. He used to get me on to sing, you know, um, grab your coat and get your hat, leave your words on the, uh, let's see, what's it called? The sunny side of the street. And then I would play some Handel or some Mozart or, uh, some Bach also. So the combination of the great American songbook and the great classical composers was a very good place for me to spend my youth <laughs> before I hit the great folk scare as one of my brothers calls it. And so it wasn't until I was 15 that I heard Barbara Allen and also uh, the Gypsy Rover on the radio. Both of them were played by uh, a disc jockey in Denver in 1955, and the Gypsy Rover came from uh, from a uh, a music um, a film called The Black Knight, which was an Alan Ladd film, and so it was very very popular, it was a big hit on the radio. You know, you remember that, and this is something I didn't know about when it happened, but the. Uh, uh, Pete Seeger and the Weavers had a big hit in 1950 when I was about, what, 12? Maybe 12, yes, I was 11 in 1950. And it was with uh, Irene, good night, good night, Irene, the Hudy Ledbetter song. And they also had another hit with another folk song, I write an old pain, I think. I lead an old Dan. Maybe it's another song, but it's a, it was a country, country cowboy song too. So folk music had just peaked around the corner, as we say, in 1950, and then kept growing. And gradually, I got on the train when I was. Uh, I started getting paid for this when I was 20. 20. Let's see, it was 1959. So I was. Uh, 21, 20. I guess I was 20. Yep. Yeah. So I was 20 when I started. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And when you really kind of broke through with Wildflowers, what was that feeling like for you to just have this huge international fame? It was like nothing happened because what I was doing was going out on the road. Oh, the one thing that happened was that people started answering my phone calls. <laughs> well, that's, that's a nice perk, right? <laughs> I was always calling people about one thing or another. I wanted to do this. I wanted to, do that. I wanted to call so-and-so about the song that just wrote and that I'd heard. Oh, I was always very active. You know, you, you have to remember about if you're an artist, whether you're a painter or a singer or a poet or whatever you might be in the art, you must be willing to become a salesperson as well. Because after all, that's what you're doing. Really, you're going out on concert. You Now we bring all of our gear with us. We have t-shirts, we have CDs. We, now we have vinyls again, which is just amazing. I just signed about, I don't know, 200 vinyls of, of the album that we're talking about from the concert that, that I did at Town Hall in a pandemic 
a virtual concert, no audience, and they made an album about it, and they made a vinyl about it. How cool, <laughs> how cool. Um, people love the song, uh, Stand in the Clowns, and of course that was a huge uh, hit for you. Um, talk a little bit about making that and what, what the, that meant. And also, obviously, Stephen Sondheim just died. What, what does that mean to you? Yeah, sad, sad. You know, I, I knew him, of course, and spent time with him. At one point, I went to see him, and uh, he spent a, an entire day with me playing me songs, sitting at the piano and playing them and singing them. And I was, first of all, I was just bowled over because every note that's in every Sondheim song that was ever written are, pl are, are played, were played originally by him on the piano. And then he gives that to his orchestrator, and then the orchestrator figures out should the oboe go da 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 da? You know, should the strings do this part? But he he was he was a an amazing amazing writer, and he changed Broadway forever, made it into something different, something uh, that could experiment with all kinds of subjects in a way that was different than the Broadway before. Well, it sort of integrated a lot of different ideas about people going to hear music and to hear stories. And we love stories. I mean, we, we need to have stories in our lives, I think, to thrive, to stay on the planet. And let's face it, without them, I don't know what we would do. And Stephen Sondheim was brilliant. He wrote Send in the Clowns as an extra song in Little Night Music. And uh, I'm at a loss to say who sang it, Originally, I don't remember. I had it in my mind yesterday, but it seemed, now it's replaced by Glynis Johns, who did wind up singing it, of course. But it was uh, he didn't. It wasn't his favorite song. <laughs> he, didn't, he didn't think very much of it. <laughs> it was kind of a fill-in song, and he was underimpressed. <laughs> but then, of course, that was the one that went platinum and uh, was all over the place when I sang it, recorded it, and, and it became a big hit. Yeah. Uh, now in 2017, your version of Amazing Grace uh, was uh, oh. put into the yeah. uh, Library of Congress, uh, uh, National Registry of, of uh, Recordings, I believe. Um, what did that, I mean, that, what an incredible accomplishment. I mean, what did that mean to you to have a song in the registry? I, I was, dazzled by it. In fact, the person who called me about it was Jack Holzman, who was president of Electra. He called me up and said, did you know that both that uh, Amazing Grace is going to be forever enveloped in the Library of Congress? That's actually where my archives are. And in way back in some sometime in the 90s, I think, the um, the Library of Congress also brought my movie about my teacher, Dr. Rico, into the folds of <coughs> of the Library of Congress. I made my I made a movie about my teacher when in nineteen um, sixty no seventy five, and it it was nominated for an Academy Award. So I was able to take my teacher to, with, with my co-director, Jill Godmolo, we were able to go to Holly, Hollywood and, and uh, watch our, my, my great teacher who conducted major symphonies in the world before any other woman did. She was the first woman to, to conduct the Philharmonic, New York Philharmonic and the Berlin Philharmonic and all of, of Sibelius's orchestras she conducted. And the movie, when it came out, became a huge hit because now they had a woman to look at, to see that she could conduct. And she conducted everywhere, mostly Mozart. She went back to um, the San Francisco Symphony. She went to London. She, she had a whole resurgence of her career, which was very exciting for all of us. But yes, the Library of Congress has done me the honor of putting me in its folds, so to speak. 
Oh, it's a fantastic honor. So uh, you've done all these amazing things, but you're still rolling. You're still, you're hitting number one. What's your next number one project going to be? <laughs> I, just finished, I finished writing over the pandemic an album of all my own songs. And that's coming out in February 25th of 2020, 2022. And it's called Spellbound. And the cover's done. The mixes are done. The artwork is done. All of the lyrics have been been um, spell checked, <laughs> and so <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait to hear it. And I, it's all gonna, also going to be a vinyl, but the vinyl, you know, vinyl. This is very good for historians to know. Vinyl has come back like like a like a tsunami, and therefore there are not as many factories as there used to be. And didn't people didn't realize that it suddenly it's going to be the greatest, you know, since let's see, <coughs> the greatest thing since um, what is it? Scotch tape? No. <laughs> uh, waffles? No. I'll think of it somewhere along the line and I'll, then I'll call you tonight at three in the morning and tell you what. <laughs> you did. And sliced bread. I believe that's it. Yes. And it so yeah. sometimes, for instance, this one will not probably be out until the fall or the winter of 22 because it's lined up to be made. Uh, of course. I was lucky this vinyl of this town hall show, which people can get, I don't know what it's, Judy Collins at Town Hall, I think it's called. <coughs> and so that's been a wonderful surprise to have vinyl back with the big pictures and you can read the lyrics and you can, find out who's on it and who's in it. I find it's a lot easier to read on than it is on, on a CD box. Very hard to read those without spectacles on. Wow. Well, Judy, I'm so uh, honored to, to talk to you today. I'm very excited to see you uh, in person uh, this week. Um, oh, good. You're coming. Oh, yeah, good. I'm coming, to see, I'm coming to see it. So I'm, I'm really thrilled. I've never I'm seen sorry. it. Before. No, we won't be seeing anybody afterwards because because of the pandemic, nobody can yeah. come back. Safe. We've we've now I started back to work in full time, pretty much in May, and we haven't seen any of anybody back backstage in all these months. So yeah, well, maybe people will start getting getting all of them will getting getting vaccinated, and then we can do it. Yeah.